Well, she broke old dad up this morning. She got me good first service. A little better, a little better this service. Or something about heaven. And there's something that makes us, the older we get, want to go. Makes it a little bit sweeter. One day we'll know all the answers to all the questions. And I'm looking forward to that day of heaven. This man was teaching Sunday school one day. Had a bunch of five and six year olds in his class. And so he thought, I'm going to ask him, he says, what do y'all know about going to heaven and how can we go to heaven and live with Jesus one day? So they're all paying attention. He says, what if, let me ask you this. He said, what if I sold all my possessions, sold my house, my cars and everything, and I gave the money to the church? Would I go to heaven then? And they said, no, 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 you wouldn't go to heaven then. He says, okay. He said, well, what about this? What if I went and cleaned the church every day and I mowed the churchyard and just kept things neat and tidy? Would I go to heaven then? And the kid says, no, no, you wouldn't go to heaven. That, that's not going to get you to heaven. He says, okay. He said, well, what if I gave candy to all the little church children in the, every Sunday and I was nice to animals and I was nice to my family? Would that get me into heaven? No, no, teacher, that's not going to get you into heaven. So he said, okay, here I go. He said, well, what can I do to go to heaven? And this one little six-year-old boy stands up and says, you got to die first. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Once we close our eyes in this final time on this earth, the afterlife comes. That's when we get to experience heaven. If you're a child of God, if you're a believer, you get to experience heaven. You know, I've heard about heaven my whole life, and I've heard sermons on heaven my whole life and preached on heaven a few times, taught about heaven. And if I've used, you might say, Jason, I've heard that a hundred times. Well, hear it for 101 this morning. And if you still don't get excited about talking and hearing about heaven, then you need to come pray this morning because I think there's something exciting and wonderful about heaven. Amen. We're going to read some texts this morning. We're going to read out of John. We're going to read what the Bible says about heaven because I believe heaven is real. Amen? I believe it's real. And how do I know it's real? Well, let's read what John has to say about that. John 14, 1 through 6, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, I know there's different interpretations. I don't want a room. I don't want a dwelling place. I want a mansion. Don't you agree? That's right. I want a mansion. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and I prepare that place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas says, Lord, how do we know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus answered in verse 6 and says, Jesus says to him, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We read over in Revelations where John is speaking about Revelation 21, verses 2 through 5. He says, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Verse 4 says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. And the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and they're faithful. The next verse we read there is a little bit later on in verse 15. He, John says, and he talked with me, and he had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out as, four square, as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. And he measured the city with reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. You know, how do I know heaven is real? Because if I believe God's word, I believe heaven is real. Amen? 
because it says it's real. Jesus says, I have gone to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself. So if I believe the Bible, I believe heaven is a real place, and it's a real home for his children. You know, we look at the three heavens. We talk about them. And 2 Corinthians 2.12 talks about a man who is called up in the third heaven. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such as one was called up to the third heaven. And logic dictates that they, if there is a third heaven, there is a first and second heaven. We know the third heaven in Scripture is where God Almighty rules and reigns over the universe with his holy angels. This is where the righteous receive their crowns of life after hearing the words, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. There are mansions of splendor. There are robes that have to be dazzling white. The third heaven is our eternal home as children of the most high God. It's the city where the lamb is the light, where tears are never shed and goodbyes are never uttered. There's no sorrow, no pain, only joy and sheer perfection. It is a city where what we will one day join the angels in singing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, around the throne of God. You see, the first heaven is what we see. It's what our eyes can see. It's what we have, the, the sun, the moon, the stars. What you see on a beautiful night as far as telescopes and technology can show us. That's the first heaven. And then there's the second heaven. That's Satan's throne room. Satan is not in hell. He's not in a compartment of hell. He will go to hell. He will be bound with a chain and thrown into hell. I like it like this when we talk about that one day. Satan is really good about reminding us of our past and our past mistakes and our past failures. But I like what we can say to Satan. Satan, you may know my past, but I know your future. I know what's going to happen to you. You could come at me with my past, but I'm going to come at you with your future because one day I'm going to enjoy seeing Satan, what God has promised he's going to do to you. Oh, I look at heaven. Heaven is near. Heaven is near. David tells us in 1 Samuel 20, we read about what David is going through. And we know that King Saul is, is trying to kill him. And he's talking to Jonathan, King Saul's son. And and he was expressing how afraid he is in previous verses about how tormented he was about Saul trying to take his life. And he concluded by saying this, David, a young man, says, I feel like I'm a step away from death. There's just a step. Life is so grieved. Life is so fragile. And in this season of David's life, he realizes I could be here in one moment and I could be gone the next Heaven is more near than we realize a lot of times. That's a profound thought. It's something that we should always be aware of, that we are one step away from the afterlife. Just like the little boy in Sunday school says, yeah, the only way we can get to heaven is to die. And there is truth in that. Death can come suddenly. Death can come instantly. It can come unexpectedly. But are we ready? Are we ready to face God? Hebrews 9, 27, Scripture tells us, and it is appointed for men to die once, but after that, the judgment. We're going to answer to the God that give us life. We know that kings die, queens die, rich people, poor people, smart people, literate people, young people, old people. It does not matter. We all will die and face the judgment. Where will we spend eternity? You see, church attendance won't get us into heaven. Crying tears and pleading with God won't get us into heaven. But only the blood of Christ cleanses all from unrighteousness. You know, we read earlier in John 14 that there's no other name, no other way whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way. Jesus is the truth. He is the life. There's no other way, no other truth, no other life. That's just deception. That's a lie. Jesus is the way. Jesus is, said heaven is a place. In John 14, he says, I go to prepare. Listen, he says, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus lived in heaven. He came down to earth and he testified, I'm telling you I've been in heaven. I'm now on earth and I'm promising you that there is a heaven. It's real. It's eternal. It's a place. There is a place. Jesus was saying it's not a fairy tale. There is Jesus who is making this promise of heaven. Oh, there is another life beyond this life. 
There is another place beyond this earth we live on today. And folks, it is more glorious, it is more splendid than anything that we can even imagine. And Jesus himself, Jesus himself has prepared that place for you and me. And it's real. Its beauty is beyond anything that our earthly minds can ever imagine. Our fourth point today is heaven is unimaginable. The Apostle Paul went to heaven in 1 Corinthians 2 9, and he wrote, Eyes have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those. Did you get that? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things that our God has prepared for those who love him. I think that's going to be something special, amen, because I think God has prepared something special for his children. We know that Paul was one of the most brilliant scholars perhaps the world has ever known. His writings were even more masterful than people like Shakespeare. He has the profound ability to put pen to paper with thoughts and things and theology that is so brilliant that scholars today still marvel at the genius of the Apostle Paul. For him to use words like a wordsmith and, the, and create ideas and complex thoughts that relay the love and the greatness of our God. And yet, after he went to heaven and came back, this same man, when Paul saw the glory and the splendor of heaven, he says, men will not believe what I've seen. The half has not ever been told. In other words, Paul is saying, let your imagination run wild about what heaven's going to be like. Now, a lot of you have your favorite things. You have your favorite places to go. Where's our beach people? We got any beach people out here? Where's our mountain? We got any mountain people out here? Well, I'm just not a beach person. The sun doesn't like me. And when you mix heat and sweat and sunscreen and sand, I just don't care for it. I'm good for one, maybe one and a half, two days, and that's it. I can only watch people for so long. But I'm not a beach person. And you may be a, a mountain person. You may like those things. You may like the beach. But think about your favorite things, your favorite places that you go. And I want you to think of the happiest, the most gorgeous, the most beautiful, splendid thing that you could ever imagine with every comfort and every blessing and every joy. And Paul says, it's only about half of what you can imagine. You can imagine half of what God has prepared for you, a place that's called heaven. The Apostle John saw heaven, and in his book of Revelation, he wrote a traveler's review for us. He said that the city of New Jerusalem, and, and it's four square, and the four square we know speaks of perfection. Nothing on earth is perfect. You and I aren't perfect. We can buy a new home, and the termites can attack the new home. The water pipes can break in the new home and destroy our home. All kinds of things can happen. How do you like it when you buy a brand new car and you go to Walmart and you come back with your groceries? Somebody's dinged your car. It never gets better, does it, Tracy? You, that, that perfectness is gone. I had this beautiful thing, and now it's messed up. And every time you walk up to the car, you're going to see that ding, right? The Apostle John's talking about heaven. He's talking about how perfect it is. Nothing on earth is perfect, but he said this, I saw 12 gates of pearl. I saw streets of pure gold. Think about this. God does his street paving with gold. He paves the streets in gold, and you think you have arrived, and wait till you see this place called heaven. Oh, he says it's 1,500 miles square, north, south, east, west, 12 foundations. He said the first layer is made of diamonds, the second layer of rubies, the third sapphires, the fourth emeralds, and so on and so on, the precious stones. We know that heaven would stretch from Carolinas to California. From Canada to Mexico, it's approximately 40 times the size of England, 10 times the mass of France, bigger than India. And that's just the ground floor. Oh, it's as tall as it is wide, 600,000 stories high, more than enough room for billions of people to come and go. All this morning in the theater of your mind, when you think about heaven, I want you to walk on the streets of gold. Look at those gates of pearl. Look at the names that are written above those doors and the clusters of diamonds. You might see Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, Daniel, Ezekiel, David, Elisha. Maybe you see your mother's name, your father's name, a brother, a sister, a family member, a close friend. It's right there among them. 
We haven't lost that person. They are in a place called heaven and they await our arrival with joy. I believe heaven's a place of rest. The Bible says that we will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the text said, and we will be at rest. Oh, I believe heaven's going to be a great reunion. I want you to imagine in your mind the great reunion. Imagine listening over the balconies of heaven this morning. You hear the sounds that mortal ears have never heard. Oh, I believe that the sounds of a heavenly choir singing sounds of praise. I believe there's an orchestra in heaven that are playing every instrument that's been invented to glorify God this morning. And I believe the worship cannot even be imagined in heaven. All we know Paul talks about ears have not heard. Paul was referring to the music and the worship in heaven. There's going to be a grand reunion around the throne of God in those days. And those who are alive will remain, will be called up in a twinkling of an eye. I believe the blink of an eye and it's over. We'll be left behind. Oh, I believe we're going to, some will be going to a city where the roses never fade. Going to a city where the blind see and the lame walk. Going to a city where there are no more tears, no more death, no more party. Oh, we're going to a city where we, no negativity whatsoever exists in a place called heaven. The bottom line, no negative, no death, no depression, no suicide, no addiction, no alcoholism, no pain. I'm looking forward to that one, amen. No pain, no suffering, no tears, no aches, no headaches, no troubles. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Folks, that's why it's worth it. That's why we go through life and, yeah, we have burdens. But one of these days we're going to hear our Lord and Master say, come up here and let me show you what true joy is. Let me show you what I prepare for those who have loved me. The greatest attraction, make no doubt, is in heaven is Jesus Christ. Heaven is where Jesus is. Heaven is heaven because of Jesus. And we're going to be with him and we're going to be with them, our loved ones, our family, in the great body of Christ. Oh, we shall see him as the scripture describes him. The Virgin Mary saw Jesus as a little baby. John the Baptist saw Jesus as a candidate for water baptism, water baptism on the muddy banks of the Jordan River. Oh, I believe the disciples saw Jesus as the great rabbi and the great teacher. The inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem, they cried, crucify him. They saw Jesus as a common criminal. Oh, church, but when we see Jesus, when we see him as he is, we shall see him as the king of kings and lord of lords. We're going to see him as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the living water, the bread of life. We're going to see him as the bright morning star, our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our strong tower. We're going to see him as our burden bearer, the one that bore my burdens and carried my griefs, the one who took my sins away. That's one. That's my great shepherd. That's my great physician. He's the great I am. He's heaven's wonder and he's hell's dread. His name is Jesus. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And we will see him on that day as who he is. And I'm excited about that day. Our last point today we talk about is when I go to heaven. When I go to heaven, what am I going to experience, Jason, when I leave this world and go to heaven? Just like the little boy said, one day we will all face death. When we ex what will we experience when we face death as Christians? You see, there's a way to die. People have to understand that, yes, there's a way to live, but we need to know how to act when we're facing the end of the road. And when it finally comes for us or someone near to us and we realize there's a way to go. You know, for the unbelievers, death can be terror, it can be fear, it can be torment, dread, hopelessness, despair, and then it's over. But if you are a believer, if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, you have to understand what is about to happen when we leave this world for the afterlife. I believe it's the most glorious thing that we can ever imagine. It's often said that the eye is the window to the soul. The eyes do communicate various emotions. When we get wide-eyed, we communicate in fear, and sometimes we squint our eyes in anger or disgust, and sometimes we have dreamy eyes that communicate love and affection. In his Sermon on the Mount, Christ taught his disciples that the eye is the light of the soul. Proverbs 30 instructs us that a look in the eye can tell us a lot about what is going on in the soul and the spirit of a man. As most of you know, my previous life and the last 30 years, I've been a licensed funeral director and embalmer. I've been a coroner. 
And I've been around a lot, thousands and thousands of people right after they have entered into eternity. And one thing as for me that I have always noticed is people's eyes. I look at the eyes. You look at someone's eyes that are peaceful. You look at someone's eyes that maybe seem tormented. And I always wonder what are they seeing when they close their eyes in life and entered into the afterlife, what are their eyes trying to say? Is it something that's good? Is it peaceful? I'm seeing the angels. I'm seeing my Savior, Jesus Christ. Am I, or am I seeing things I wish I had never seen in my life? You know, Paul puts it like this. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Oh, we don't shout over that when we don't get happy because we're too in love sometimes with this world. But if we understood what's on the other side, Again, not a trace of negativity in the world. God himself is going to wipe every tear from their eyes. No sorrow, no death, dying, pain, agony. It'll be over. What will happen when a Christian dies? I heard a preacher put it like this. I thought it was pretty exciting. He said, what we will see, I believe, when a Christian dies, the first thing is I think we'll see dazzling lights of squadrons of angels as they fill our room. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. That's why he gives such careful attention to it. The word precious doesn't mean common, normal, average, ordinary. You see, any time a, a child of God dies, it has the full eye of God on that moment and in, on that place because it, he dispatches the angels. According to the book of Luke, Luke we read about, Luke 16, 22, that the beggar died and he was carried by the angels. He goes on to say, suddenly, even though the people in the room with you may not see it, but if you're a righteous believer, angels will fill the room. You will feel a peace and calm overcoming you that surpasses all human understanding. You will realize and see in those bright lights around you, I am entering into a new world. Those angels will speak to you in the most soft and tender voice and say, Jesus is awaiting for your arrival. Are you ready to go? He says, and as those angels take you by the hands, they will put you in the arms of angels and they will begin to carry you. You'll look down on your cold, lifeless body. You'll look down on those maybe that are in there weeping for you. But suddenly a joy will fill your soul as you realize I'm leaving this world. And as you're rising up with the angels, you will look down and see that blue ball down there called earth. And you're rising into a new domain through the heaven. And you might enter into that dark place just for a moment that feels heavy. But suddenly the angels will announce, there's a blood-bought child of Christ coming through. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Fall, prostrate, demon spirits. One preacher said, I believe you're going right through the devil's living room as you're going into heaven. And he's sitting there, and you can look at him, and he's crying. And as you continue to ascend, just like when Jesus walked through the walls in his glorified body in the upper room, when he rose from the dead, you're going to have a brand new glorified body. You see, God is not just gaining new angels. He is calling us home to worship. He is calling us home to worship him, to join with those that are already here, there. He's calling his worshipers home. Oh, church, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. When we all see Jesus, church, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory. Thank you for being part of our service today. Our prayer at Zion's Cause is that this service drew you closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. We look forward to you joining us again next week. On behalf of the pastor, staff, and congregation, may God richly bless you and keep you.